Okay, good morning everyone. Um, nice to see you here bright and early on Saturday morning for some stats. Uh, I'll always know that there are lots of people out there who are keen for this sort of thing, keen enough to get up and do it this early in the morning, so great to see you all. Um, my name is Jeremy, this is Miko. Uh, we are going to be leading this session uh, and uh, as the title suggests, we're going to try and cover a lot of different things about moderation. Um, we start some from a uh, from the basics and taking it up to a moderately high level, so hopefully there'll be something for everyone here. Um, we have a number of um, QR codes throughout the session that you might be interested in. Um, they're also up on the wall there, there's three of them. We'll talk through them as we get to them, but this one is the one on the left there. And this is a link to a page which has various resources. Uh, that we're using in this, uh, in this workshop. Uh, they include a dummy data set, they include various uh, syntax uh, in the three different languages, uh, sorry, three different software, so SPSS, R, and Stata. Um, previous experience has told us that we're likely to have users of all three here. Um, maybe it's just worth seeing a show of hands. How many people here use R? Okay, how many people here use Stata? How many people here use SPSS? Okay, so. I've seen a nice trend from last year. Yeah. More R users. More R users, yeah. I think it's probably going to be uh, increasingly so as the years go on, but uh, we've got resources for all three languages, all three software for you. There are some differences um, in them that we will talk about as we go through. But um, the other thing is the link to some Excel templates, which, especially if you use SPSS, um, will be useful in um, helping you plot interaction effects. Uh, you can do it automatically in the other two packages, um, although some people choose to um, do it in Excel and manipulate uh, the plot uh, appropriately anyway. So, um, I'm going to hand over to Biko to say something about yeah, and I have this hobby of, of having cheating on my YouTube channel and go ahead and subscribe and try to give them medium views, which will happen on any day now. And I have a playlist about Horizon and, and interaction effects that I've got last week this session. I'll also be recording this session so I can work on watch it later. Uh, you can find it on my YouTube channel. If you ask a question and you want it to be edited out, come back to me and I will, uh, I will make note of who you are. They just edit it out so that uh, we are not on the video. The, uh, the camera is set so that it just records us. It's, uh, it's zoomed in to the other slides now, so you are going to go And uh, yeah, go. So. Then we have questions. So this is the second uh, important QR code. And uh, there's a system where you can post questions and then uh, you can upload questions posted by others. The QR code for posting questions is there in the middle. So if you need it later, you can just get it there. And you can, of course, ask questions by raising your hand. Uh, we'll have spots for questions, uh, maybe four or five times during the next few hours. We, we talk to one segment of the presentation, and then, then we take the questions. If there's like a, a short clarification that you'd like to have immediately, just raise your hands, and we will uh, we'll, uh, try to have them. But if it's like a bigger question, please say it to uh, the hand when we take questions, or post it here, and we'll follow it. Here. Yeah, and how you uh, go back, how you post questions is that you just type something there, like right? example, example question, and there's a button for sending, and then there's uh, there's this hard sign that allows you to upload the question, and we will receive them in the order of how many people have uh, the hard signs there. Yeah, okay, so first of all, a quick question for you. Um, so far you've heard me speaking with the room microphone, Miko speaking without it. Is it helpful for us to use this microphone? Yes. At the back? Yes, okay, so we'll, um, we sat back in to talk. Okay, um, so just a very brief introduction to moderation first of all. I'm guessing that you all have some idea of what moderation is about. If not, then getting up this early on Saturday morning for a round of stats PTW is very brave. Um, but Moderation is basically where a relationship between two variables, normally two variables, we're going to stick with the two variables thing for the most part today, um, is dependent on a third variable, or sometimes a fourth variable. 
Um, so, to what extent is the relationship between x and y dependent on another variable which we call the moderator? Um, now, this is often going to be linear effects, uh, and we'll spend a good portion of the next half hour or so talking a bit about two-way interaction effects, which are way more linear effect which is moderated, but we're going to then go on to talk about more complex effects as well, such as curvilinear interactions, uh, where you've got a, a quadratic relationship, for example, where you might have, in, under some conditions, a, a distinct curvature to a relationship, but other situations, a different curvature, or maybe a straight line relationship between two variables. Um, we're going to talk about three-way interactions, which is where you have um, two moderators which uh, operate in conjunction with each other. In other words, um, the relationship between x and y is dependent not just on a variable z or a variable w, but the way they interact with each other as well. Um, we'll talk about some examples of those. Um, and um, we'll also talk about situations where we've got non-linear uh, effects because the outcome is not continuous or is not normally distributed. Um, I saw this actually about really directly related to non-linear model. Yeah. So, um, so I'm, gonna, I'm not going to talk about this example now in any detail, but I'll let Nico talk about that uh, a little bit later. Um, I should say also that the slides are up on the resources page as well. Um, that's the QR code on the left up there. So um, if we skip through anything more quickly that you're able to make notes on or, or, or take in, uh, it will all be there for you. So how are we going to do this? Uh, well, we're going to have basically four se separate sections of this. We've had the introduction. This is the end of the introduction. Um, We'll spend um, a good amount of time now talking about some of the, the basics, the two-way interaction effects with linear relationships, uh, because there's actually quite a lot there. You might think you understand them, and actually many of you probably will understand them, but you might not understand everything about them, and really understanding what the uh, particular elements of why you test the particular way and what an equation means and so on is really helpful in understanding the more complex ones, which we'll come on to later. Um, as Miko says, we'll have uh, a, a slot for questions at the end of each of these sections. Um, so uh, if you do have questions um, about them, uh, please use the QR code for questions to post to them, um, and then we'll collate those at the end of each section. Uh, if there are some which will be answered later in the session, we'll come back to those at the time. But for now, let's we'll start just by talking about two-way interactions. So many of you, probably most of you, possibly all of you, are already familiar with the uh, equation, the standard equation for testing two-way interactions, where we've got um, an independent variable, which we call x. We've got uh, a moderating variable, moderator, which we'll call Z, and being British, I normally call this Z, so if I slip into calling it Z, then please forgive me, um, but it means the same thing. And we have the interaction term, which is just X multiplied by Z. And if that interaction term is, uh, is non-zero, is statistically significant, if we're talking in terms of significance, then that is an indication that there is moderation there. Why is this? Well, if we rearrange that equation, we can make it look like this. So it is a relationship between y and x, where the intercept is given by b0 plus b2z, and the slope is given by b1 plus b3z. So both the intercept and the slope are themselves dependent on the variable z, the moderator. And Therefore, if z is, um, has different values, both the intercept and the moderator take on different values. And in particular, if the coefficient b3 is non-zero, then that means there is some way in which the slope changes as z changes. So we're going to demonstrate this in a few ways. Um, to do this, we're going to use an example data set, which is on the resources page. 
Um, I'll just very briefly throw out it's, it, it's not a real data set, it's a simulated data set with um, data from 424 people. Um, and we've got a number of different variables in there training and autonomy, we'll talk about uh, in a few minutes, uh, responsibility and age, uh, other independent variables there. And we've got different dependent variables, so job satisfaction and well being are our continuous dependent variables. Uh, whether or not you've received a bonus is a binary variable, and the number of days absence in the last year is a count variable. So I don't need to go into any more detail on that now, but it's just uh, to set that up for you. Um, and if we want to test a two-way interaction, we just need to remember what we put into that regression equation. So we need to have, in whichever software we use, we need to have three predictive variables in the model. The x, which in this case might be training, the provision of training, which is a variable train in the data set. Uh, moderator, or the z variable, which is age in the example here. Um, and then we also need to include the interaction between them. And you can see um, in the different forms of the software, whichever software you're used to, that will hopefully make some sense to you. Um, and just, just to be a uh, note on the, uh, on the syntax, we, will, we have lots of syntax on the slides. We'll not walk you through it in detail, but we'll highlight a few things uh, that might not be uh, obvious or might not be well known. And, and this is one of the things. It's how Stata specifies interaction terms. And it's uh, use something called factor variable notation. And if you don't uh, understand what the hash means, and you stay up, then the next thing that you should do is help get the uh, R list, factor variable, variable, variable list. And uh, if you have two hashes, that means that everything, all possible law of returns will be automatically included. And this is the 99.9% .9 of the cases you should use two, two hashes. There are a few special cases where you would not include the first order terms. Like if you have a, a variable that doesn't vary within individual and you have individual fixed effects in your inner model, then uh, you would be using just a single uh, hash and, and including all the variables by, uh, by hand. Another thing that is important to know is that when you specify an interaction, you need to tell Stata whether it's a continuous interaction or a categorical interaction. If you omit the C, then Stata will be, make a categorical interaction, which means that it creates all combinations of, of unique values of the variable. And let's say that we have, for example, uh, uh, a course grade from 4 to 10, and uh, we want to have an interaction involving that. If we have a categorical interaction, then you basically create dummies for each different grade, and then uh, use the dummies in the interactions. In continuous interaction, you just use the variable as such a multiplier. So for default, this data is categorical for issues that you have to go and ask data for. They actually have statisticians here who know something about data statistics. So, yes, but this is our uh, syntax for data. Yeah, thanks. Um, I also just worth coming back to the previous slides to say this, uh, this might not be obvious to people. If you're using R, then the interaction is calculated as part of the linear modeling procedure by using the asterisk between the variables. If you're using SPSS, then it doesn't do quite the same thing. Um, if you are using the regression procedure, as this is here, you actually have to calculate the interaction term separately, which is what the first line is about there. There are other procedures in SPSS, such as the GLM procedure and some of the general, uh, sorry, generalized linear model procedures, where it can actually do it as part of the procedure. But the way SPSS works is a little bit haphazard at times, so you just need to no, which one do you do? In state and R, you can also calculate the interaction before uh, you actually run the regression, but that's that's not advisable for for a couple of reasons. First, it's it's an unnecessary line of code and complicates your analysis. But more importantly, if you specify the interaction as a part of model, then uh, all plotting commands and all prediction commands that you can run after regression analysis will be aware of that interaction. If we create this variable then uh, any state comment after you run on that, that interaction variable you would not know that that variable is actually an interaction because how you code in the data, uh, or how you created the variable, is not stored as a part of the variable itself. 
but always always in R and stay up. Specify interactions uh, in the model, don't create variables. So that's a good rule of thumb. Okay, so and, and just, just a side note, there's uh, some questions coming. So uh, people have found our QR code. Great. So um, you, you can run the analysis using this uh, code, and you can see whether or not you've got the interaction by seeing whether the interaction term is significant. But what do we do then? Well, the most common thing to do, and one thing that we would pretty much always recommend, with any significant interaction at least, is plotting it. Because by plotting it, you get a much better sense of what the relationships between the variables are and how that varies by the moderator. But how do we get from that output, um, which is some example, SPSS output, to the plot that you see down there? Well, it's simply using the regression equation and substituting in values for the independent variable and moderator. So, in this case here, what we've done is we've put in values um, for age, which are 25 and 55, representing a, a younger worker and an older worker in this case. Um, we put values in for provision of training, which are 1 and 5, which are the, the minimum and maximum values um, there are, which, given it's the independent variable, is a quite a sensible way of doing that. Um, and it just works through the equation. So, um, you see the intercept there, that's the minus 0 0.014 from the output. The coefficient of age is 0 0.047, and that's multiplied by 25 or 55, and so on. I don't need to run through every line with you there, but we get a value of job satisfaction for each. Those four values there are the values which are plotted on the right hand side. So we can see in this case that for the um, younger people, age 25, there is a steeper, more positive relationship between training and job satisfaction. Uh, whereas for the age 55 people, the dotted line uh, in the plot, you can see it is less steep, uh, it's still in the positive direction. Um, so, it can be quite helpful to run through doing this by hand once or twice, doing it yourself, so you see where it comes from, but of course you don't need to do that every single time. Um, if you're using SPSS, unfortunately it won't give you this plot automatically, but you can just put the coefficients there into a template. This is one of the templates I've got on, on my website. Again, it's links from the resources page um, where you can put in the variable names, put in the coefficients, um, put in either the means and the standard deviations of the variables, um, or put in the va values of the variables that you want to plot the slopes at, um, which will uh, overwrite what's in the means and standard deviations if you leave that blank, it will automatically plot it at one standard deviation below and above the mean, which may or may not be a sensible thing to do, we'll talk about that later. Um, and it will produce a plot like this, which, um, although it's a relatively basic one, we'll talk about more complex plots in, in a few minutes, um, it's still a good enough one to give you a good, a good idea of what's happening there, and indeed, uh, for many publications, that will be sufficient as well. And we'll hand it to Biko to talk about the other software. Yeah. So, um, do you hear me without the microphone? You should not be here. This is better. I think this is better. In, in state on R, you follow basically the same approach, but it's implemented in your, your software. So the, uh, the idea is that you calculate predictions based on the model. So you have specified combinations of variables or values. Uh, with which you predict. So we are predicting here with, with uh, training equals 1 and 5, and age equals 25 and 55. And uh, then uh, you calculate predictions, four predictions, and then uh, you plot. And there are two different ways of doing this. Either you're doing just a single step where you predict the plot, which is a quick thing to do, and this is a, a good way if you just want to do some basic plot plotting. But sometimes you need to have more control over what the plot looks like. And in that case, you might want to split it into, uh, into two different steps, where you uh, first predict and then you plot. So uh, this would be an example of uh, how you do absolutely with my computer to see the slides instead of the, uh, the correct one. But uh, this would be the two, two uh, 
uh, two-step approach which gives you more control. In state up, the commands for plotting are, are margins, which calculates predictions, and, and if you have a plot option, then it does some basic plot. If you want to have more control, then you can add margins plot. And that allows you to, for example, uh, add, let's say, if you want to add another graphic, like if you want to add observation markers to the plot, then having the plotting as a separate uh, uh, step would be better. In R, you can use uh, uh, plotting uh, prediction command like the plot predictions here, draw it was false. I'll talk about the library in the next slide. And then we uh, just use uh, GT plot, which is one of the graphics libraries to do the plotting. Again, this gives you more flexibility. So if, there are, if the plotting library that you use doesn't really provide you what you want, you can just uh, calculate the predictions and then plot with the different library. Now, uh, one thing that students always ask me when I start teaching the moderation in an R is which, uh, which R libraries should you apply? Because there are at least 10 different R libraries that do moderation mod, interaction plots that one might apply. And I've come to uh, the conclusion that the marginal effects package is uh, my favorite now. And when you pick a package, you need to think about what other packages you're using. And I like using digiplot, and this does plot it with digiplot instead of, for example, uh, the effects package which uses the low order lattice graphic system. And you also need to think about what kind of models are supported, because the support for, for like, let's say, multiple model needs to be programmed in, so it doesn't work the same way as data, that much is works with everything, but the programmer of the plotting, uh, plotting library needs the program support. And this, this uh, library supports various different uh, uh, models that you might use, and if the model is non-linear, then it plots, it doesn't want non-linear plot automatically. So based on comparing, this is my current favorite. If you ask me uh, what is the uh, best in five years from now, I might have a different opinion. Also, this guy has written many other R packages that I, I, I use, and, uh, I, and he's actively working on the package. So it's useful to have a, a package that is actively maintained. So uh, I used to use John Fox's effects package, but John Fox is close to retirement. So who's going to maintain that package uh, in the future? As, as far as I know, Joe Fox is pretty all right. All right, so that is uh, about the R and state. And uh, these plots, uh, packages allow you to do all kinds of, of fancy things to your plots. Like this is, uh, uh, these are two plots. You can find the code in, in the paper that we published on ORM. In ORM. And these are two non-linear models that contain an interaction. And then I added observation markers and I added uh, these bands to indicate confidence bands for each of these lines for different levels of, of women uh, when we uh, try to explain uh, income using years of education. So you can do all kinds of fancy stuff with this. And the code is available on, on, the, uh, on the resources or in the document. The code in the resources is, is better because it's more up to date than the code in the article. All right. Then uh, the final thing that you can use is, is an online tool. I'm not sure if anyone has ever published anything with this, but we published this uh, two years ago. And any, any plot that you can uh, that you see here on this slide could be produced uh, with this uh, this online tool uh, that allows you to specify interaction models and plot them. And it, uh, it also plots the observation markers below the data, so it can actually verify if the model explains the data well or not. And uh, you can download the, the plot as a PNG or PDF, depending on whether you like to uh, work with vector graphics or bitmap graphics. And uh, so yeah, that's available. And if you just want to play around what interaction models look like, here is one that I did with Jeremy. So this builds on the previous, uh, uh, previous uh, application. And you can just have sliders there and uh, specify what kind of model you want. And add just the sliders to see how the curves uh, how the curves move as when the parameter values change in the model. So if you are theorizing, for example, various different interactions or functional forms, you can you can for, check in advance how large an effect would have to be for the interaction to become a crossover or something like that. And this is uh, from a paper that we are we're currently uh, currently working on. So with that. It didn't fly in the first journal that we tried, and we'll, we'll have a, a strategy of meeting for that paper right after this. But it is uh, 
Itu saya tanya tokoh saya. Great, thanks, Peter. Um, so, actually, while we've just been talking, I've been looking at some of the questions coming in. Um, so, uh, some of those I think we will actually answer in this next few minutes, um, but uh, if we don't get to, obviously, we'll get to this at the end of this section. Um, but now we've profited, what do we do next? Do we need to do anything next? Well, it depends, is, is, is the answer. One of the things that people often do is um, simple slope tests. Um, I'll talk about those in a little bit of detail. Um, I'll also mention the Johnson Lane technique, which is one of the questions was about, um, and also how we might go about describing the interaction a bit more systematically, because I think that is possibly the best way to go about it. But um, simple slope tests are all about looking to see whether the slopes that you have plotted are different from zero. Now, it's worth saying that I, did, I sort of skipped over what values to plot the slopes at, um, and a couple of questions are coming about why did we use those values 25 and 55 for age, and so on. Choosing appropriate values there is actually really key to simple slope tests being useful or not. Um, typically, we want to use a value which is relatively high and a value which is relatively low, because they represent the, the typical range of values that we might see. But what do we mean by typically high and typically low? Well, a standard way of doing it is to take one standard deviation above and below the mean of the moderator to plot out. And that's fine for plotting, but those values then are fairly arbitrary. If we had taken ages one standard deviation above and below the mean, we'd end up with ages exactly, but it's in the region of 26 and 52.3 or something like that. Yeah, nothing wrong with those ages at all, but they're not theoretically meaningful. They don't necessarily resonate with us as researchers. Um, so sometimes we might want to choose values which are more theoretically meaningful, such as taking points which are whole numbers on the Likert scale, or um, ages which are meaningful for high and low. You can take a percentile based approach. Um, sometimes I will use the 10th and 90th percentiles. Uh, that's actually, I think, better than using what's in the deviation above and above mean if you've got a skewed variable. Um, because sometimes, if you've got a very skewed variable, one standard deviation above, above or below the mean could even be outside the range of the data. So, um, it's worth knowing that before you decide what values to plot at. But once you have decided what values to plot at, or indeed any other values that you want to test, then looking at the simple slopes in terms of whether or not they are significantly different from zero can be a useful thing to do, at least in some circumstances. Does everyone who understand what simple slope means in this context? Do you need an explanation? So, yeah. So, yeah. So, yes. So, a simple slope is basically the, the value of the, relate, the slope between x and y at a particular value okay, of the so moderator. Yeah. Well, right, so here, simple slope would be uh, what is the, the regression coefficient for each of these lines? So, uh, so which of these regression coefficients for these four lines, four regression coefficients, are statistically significant? That is what simple slope test test. They are also called conditional effects in some other way. So going back to the example I showed earlier with the ages at 25 and 55, there's a much deeper relationship at age uh, 25, but is the one at 55 still different from zero? Is, is there still a, a significant relationship between training and job satisfaction for the 55-year-old uh, workers in this case? And notice I say for 55-year-old workers rather than for older workers, because it is specifically about that one value. And that's something I'll come on to talk about. If you have values you want to be able to test this at, and you don't necessarily have to, then um, using the Excel template that uh, I referred to on the previous um, example, you can just plug in um, 
certain information from the coefficient covariance matrix, um, and it will give you the gradient, the t value, and the p value for those particular values that you have chosen to plot it at. And um, if you do it in uh, stata or in R, then this syntax will do the same thing for you. You don't need to use the Excel file separately. Yeah, so in stata, when you have the dydx option in the margins, and, and dydx is uh, it's a very wide restrictive x, so it is uh, uh, basically an average margin of f. In, it's, in regression, it's, it's constant, but if you're non linear models, then it can vary with the individuals. But the dydx, it's, it's there, there, there even, you know, there, that's where you remember they are. You can name the option, so if you look at the, the thing about the derivative principle. And uh, then you give uh, the variable which you which effect you not know, to predict, and then uh, it gives the predicted uh, effect of that variable given the values of the covariate A's or the moderator A's. And the same here in, uh, in R, the margin of effects package, it's really great because it allows you to do everything in a single package. If you use some, some less developed uh, plotting package, then you might need to do, uh, use another package for calculating the simple slopes, but this package does it everything for you, for linear and non linear model. So, um, we've referred to this as the direct method. That's because it's a way you can use the equations to test whether that simple slope is significantly different from zero um, using a formula. There is an alternative way you can do it using what we call the indirect method. Um, the indirect method is slightly more work to begin with and probably is not worth it in a lot of simple situations, but the more complex models you come onto, the more important this becomes as a way of being able to test simple slopes. The principle behind it is that the coefficient of the IV, the coefficient of x in the uh, regression equation, gives the slope when the moderator has a value of zero because then both z and xz will be zero, um, so it just gives that um, particular, uh, particular slope. Now, that means if we rescale the moderator so that a value we're interested in becomes zero, and we can do that, we can just um, subtract or add or multiply a variable by a certain, certain amount the regression coefficients will change, but the model won't, the significance of any terms, um, or the significance of the terms we're interested in won't change. Um, and then the uh, coefficient of x in the resulting model will be a test of that particular simple slope, where the moderator in the form you currently have it has a value zero. So if you want to do it around say age equals 60, one thing we could do is just subtract 60 from the age variable, rerun the regression um, with this new version of the age variable, and then the coefficient of training, in this case, will give the simple slope test for uh, the age 60. Um, now, that will become, say, more useful with more complex models, but just a few thoughts about simple slope tests in general. So I've, I've kind of mentioned that you don't always need to do them. Um, it does seem to be very common practice to do them. I'm not sure it's always necessary. Sometimes it's very helpful to. Um, but because the simple slope test is only testing the conditional effects at one particular value of the moderator at once, it is very specific. If there are theoretically meaningful values for the moderator to do it at, that can be helpful to know. Um, certainly if we've got um, a binary moderator, um, we'll talk about categorical ones in a few minutes, but if you've got a binary moderator, that's very sensible indeed because the two values of that would be theoretically important. But if it's just a, a random uh, continuous variable with no particular theoretical values of interest, then knowing whether a slope is significant at a particular value of the moderator may not be that helpful. Um, 
So, one thing I would always um, suggest is that if you are plotting a one standard deviation above and below the mean of the moderator, it's probably not going to be worth doing simple slope tests for those values because they're quite arbitrary. Um, I would caution against um, doing that. And always remember that just because something is statistically significant doesn't mean uh, it's important. It doesn't mean that a value, a different, uh, a different value of the moderator will be significant and so on. It is merely a test of whether or not the slope can be said to be different from zero at that particular value of the moderator. So it's quite limited. You could do the same thing with a different sample size and get a very different result. Does that tell you anything about the underlying effects in the population? Not a great deal. Um, so, um, so, the other point in this slide is refers to centering. We're going to talk about that in a bit more detail in a moment, so I'm going to um, leave that for a moment. But this automatically leads on to something that other question was about, which is the Jonathan Naiman approach, regions of significance. Um, and this is something that has a certain amount of popularity uh, in the field. It basically asks the question, at what values of the moderator would this effect be significant? So in one sense, it gets around one of the problems of the simple slope test being arbitrarily chosen, because it looks at all the possible range of values of the moderator. However, it doesn't get around the other principal problem, which is saying whether something is different from zero is not saying anything necessarily how important it is. And using regions of significance testing, you would get very, very different results with exactly the same population but with different sample sizes. That doesn't mean it's completely useless. But it does mean that I think it, when it is used, it is more often than not um, not interpreted correctly. Mm -hmm. There's nothing s special about the, the values surrounding the regional significance. So in other words, we could say, oh, well, this would be significant for uh, anyone under the age of 48. Okay. That doesn't mean that 48 is a magical value at which something changes, because you do the same on a different sample size, and that's 41 or 56. You've got the same underlying effect in the population. Um, so, personally, I don't use regions of significance testing. I don't recommend that people do either, but if you see it, that's where it's coming from. So what do I do? Well, it does depend a little bit on the context and what we're trying to show. But I always think that what we're trying to do is to describe the interaction in a meaningful way. That's why we do this post hoc probing, in other words, everything that we do after we've found the original interaction to be significant. We want to be able to say what this interaction means. Um, generally speaking, we're not then trying to test a new hypotheses. To say there are some exceptions to that, especially with, of course, a binary moderator. But um, most of the time, actually, all we want to do is describe the interaction in a helpful way. So, um, what I would propose is that we do something like this. We, first of all, we plot the interaction. Um, that will give us a, probably most of what we need, really, to determine whether our original hypothesis was supported or not. Um, but we can also describe it more thoroughly by saying whether the x-y relationship is significant at the mean value z. Um, also evaluate whether it's positive or negative at the extreme values of z. So we can say whether it's always positive or it's often mostly positive or it's a crossover effect or something like that. Uh, we can do the same with the moderator if that's of interest, um, which sometimes it will be, sometimes less so. Um, but we should also give some sort of effect size for the interaction, because that's the way we would want to describe effects too. Now, 
there are different forms of effect signs out there for moderation. Um, often you see uh, F squared, which is a proportional reduction in R squared um, explained by the interaction. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with that, but it doesn't describe the effect in real terms. Um, what we need to remember, though, is that the B3 coefficient, the interaction term coefficient, is actually a very useful effect size because it tells us how much the slope in the relationship between X and Y changes for a one unit increase in the moderator. And if we remember that and try to describe an effect in those terms, that will often be enough to explain how big the effect is. And so, finally, I'll just say, although I'm not going to say don't use simple effects, sorry, simple slope testing, only use them when there is a specific value of the moderator that you think will be useful to describe that act. So, uh, I'm going to hand it to Beacon now to uh, stay All right. Uh, a few words about centering, I assume, if I remember the core, but they are the presentation structure correctly. And a lot of people make a big point about centering the data. Uh, I tell my students never to center the data. And uh, the reason why I tell my students that is that if you do plotting and if you do simple slope testing, then you always need to uh, kind of like back center the data. Like if you have ages of 55, 25 and 55, then you center your data then the ages become like, like minus 16 and, and 20 or something like that. And then you have to uh, convert it back to the original metric to make it a useful plot. Uh, the argument for centering is that um, when you have a regression uh, model in a, in a regression table, the effect of, um, of x in that when you have x and m in the regression model doesn't make sense unless you, you center. For example, in here, in this case, when you have training and then you have H as a moderator, then the regression model tells you what is the, uh, the effect of X when the moderator is zero. So if you just look at the regression coefficient, in this case, uh, it tells us what is the effect of training for a person with zero years of age. And there is no such person in the sample, so the regression coefficient is meaningless. So it depends on, on how much value you put into the regression coefficients and how much value you put it into the uh, ease of plotting. And I always interpret these models with plotting, I don't look at the regression coefficients, I look at the significance of the interaction term, but not the coefficient themselves. So it's kind of like uh, depending on, on how you put the model. So what does centering do? We have <coughs> here some um, synthetic data, x1 and x2, and uh, the means are twos, and when we center, we, we subtract the mean from the variable, so we subtract minus 2 for every value of x1 and x2. And the scatter plot shows here that x1, x2 is highly correlated with x2 and x1 because uh, yeah, x, x1, x2 is, uh, is dependent on x1 and x2. When we center, it tends to break this correlation. So there is a strong statistical uh, relationship, but it's more of like a butterfly shape than a linear shape. And uh, what does centering do in regression uh, results? If you have a model with centered data, we have the right plot. The model on the right is centered, the model on the left is non-centered. It doesn't do anything except it changes the intercept. It just, just kind of shifts the all the values to one direction and that affects the intercept because you're not doing anything to represent your fly. You're just shifting it some, some way. And in the interaction model, uh, what happens is that uh, the effects of x1 and x2 will be different but the interaction term will be the same. And, and why is that? It is again because the effects here in the left hand side are effects when x1, x2 equals zero, which happens when either x1 or x2 is zero. And uh, x1 and x2 are effects at, at mean value. So are we interested in, in the effect of x on the mean value of the moderator, or are we interested in the effect of x uh, on when the moderator is zero? Do people be interested in the mean value, but if you interpret from plotting, with plotting it doesn't really make a difference. If we take a look at, look at the plot, and this is a three-dimensional plot, so it takes a little bit of orienting uh, yourself, the uh, 
This is the dependent variable y here, so it goes up. This is x2, and this is x1. And this grid presents all the possible effects of x1 on y as a function of x2. So you can see that the repression line of x1 is very steep when x2 is a uh, large value by here, and the effect of uh, x1 is smaller when x2 is zero. And when we do centering, we basically are, uh, when we do the regression analysis, we have to pick which one of these all possible regression lines, because the regression line is not constant, it varies as a function of the moderator, which of these regression lines we, we pick into our model, into our regression table. And if you center the data, you pick the line from the middle of the data, so this is the green line, and if you don't center, then you pick the line at zero. And if we just need one to explain this data with a single line, then the green one would be there. So that tells you, like on average, which direction of uh, how, how much y is affected by x1. But if we plot multiple lines based on the model, which we always should do, then uh, it doesn't really make a difference what, which one of these lines we pick in our regression table. I hope that makes sense. So, uh, centering is, is pretty much no fair use. Unless you just present regression results without the plotting. In which case, same trend is pretty accessible. Yeah. Then, uh, this is your sheet. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, So, just a, yes, just a brief note about using categorical moderators. After this slide, we'll stop and take some of the questions that you've been putting in and uh, give opportunity for more questions. But um, a couple of the questions did actually relate to. Uh, using binary variables. Um, so, I'm sort of thinking mainly about the moderator being binary, although actually, because we've got an equivalent in the moderator and the independent variable, the, symmet the equation symmetrical in this price for an independent variable as well. Um, basically, we do exactly the same thing to test it. There's no difference in the way we actually run the regression to test whether the interaction is significant. Um, it's helpful if the moderator is coded as 0 and 1 for interpretation, but it's not essential. It can use other values as well. The, as Nick has just explained, just the centering doesn't make any actual difference to um, whether or not we find an effect to be significant and how it's plotted and so on. The same is true with whether we code a moderator with 0 and 1 or something else. Um, but if you do code it with 0 and 1, then obviously um, the effect of the independent variable, the x coefficient, is the value of the slope when the moderator has value 0, which is more meaningful. And for that reason, using simple slope tests when you've got a categorical moderator is a lot more uh, sensible. It's makes a great deal more sense theoretically to ask whether an effect is significant for men and women separately than for, for, for two arbitrary agents, for example. Um, there are some specific uh, issues around uh, power and other uh, issues around heterogeneity um, for uh, categorical moderators. And um, Herman Aguilis, who many of you will be familiar with, he is he's a very influential figure in academy management. He's also done lots of work on interaction effects over the years. He has a number of tools which are available at the website you see there, which can help with those. Um, because this is only a two-hour session rather than a five-hour session, we're not going to go into the detail of those now, but if you are interested in looking at also with categorical moderators, I'd encourage you to um, to look at those. Final thing to say is if you have more than two categories, that's obviously a different situation. You have to then use um, something which is specifically for categorical variables. In SPSS, that would probably be using the ANCOVA procedure or GNN procedure. Um, and if you're using uh, R, then you need to make sure that your moderator is specified as a factor. As Vico said earlier, that's the default in state or anyway. So it shouldn't be a problem. So uh, now I think we're going to just put up some of the questions. Yeah, I'll, I'll plug in my computer and uh, we can go to the question list and then can you? Yeah. Uh, 
it's pretty tight. It is. Yeah. So let's see. Hopefully it mirrors automatically. Yes. Did it? Yes, it did. So uh, we're just going to go through other questions. XT for some, that's not in our model. We'll talk about it later. Control variables, uh, when you do uh, control variables, then state and R will automatically uh, handle that with you. It's called, it's done submit uh, using uh, either uh, plotting at means or plotting at observed values. You can check the state and R documentation, but you don't have to do anything about it and they're handled uh, correctly. Having said that, if you're using the Excel tools for plotting it, um, then it's a good idea to center the control variables before running the analysis. That way you'll get an accurate plot out. Yeah, otherwise you have to, uh, if you don't center your control variables, you have to take a couple of means of control variables, then multiply those means of the effects of the friction coefficients and controls, and add that to your interest. And that gives you the average of control of all controls, and then you plot it with the plots with the state. But if you do this, uh, do not include the uh, the axis are scales, like some people just include plots without looking at what the scale of, of, of the y value. Then, uh, whether you include the, uh, the controls or not in the plot doesn't make a difference because they only affect how, how high the curves are. And if you don't report that, then that's pretty important. But you should always report the, the y values to the model actual credits. Then, uh, the other question Kirby and Alma Apex, we'll talk about it later. Uh, <coughs> what are the media, so maybe at the end. Uh, Panel data, nothing special about panel data. Everything could be said here as the panel data. Uh, when we talk about standard errors, use cluster over standard errors, that's pretty much the only thing that might be uh, affecting. And think, think really about uh, which effect you are interested in. Is it this, uh, the within or between or contextual effects? Are you just doing multiple effects in panel data? Do we need the standardized variable in terms of those? Uh, no. Uh, we, I think uh, Jeremy has specifically recommended against standardizing variables in one article that he has written. And uh, it's a very uh, particularly looking at standardized rigorous and estimates after ca calculating interaction models. Uh, it's a common methodological error. And there is an AMJ a best paper that does that error. I will not cite that, but I'll, I'll write a paper about that one here. I use it as a teaching example. Then uh, uh, we talked about how do you determine the ages. And ages, uh, yeah, that was given. But we talk about Johnson Luna technique. Uh, way to put latent models in effects in SCM. Uh, everything that we, we talk about that a bit toward the end of the presentation, but everything that we say applies to SCM. So SCM is this reversal with latent variables. And you can use the, uh, either the online tool or you can use the, uh, Jeremy's exorcist to plot SCM estimates as well. There's no difference. Uh, in SCMs, uh, the software support for uh, calculating an interaction plot with data or with R is uh, it's a bit more complicated question because how you estimate interaction effects in SCM is, is a non trivial question. So that probably can be automated. There are tries, and uh, some people have tried doing that, and I'll talk about that. But these are the of those automated ways of doing it for data. So we'll do it by hand. Uh, how does interaction affect statistical power? Including x m to a model that includes an x will increase the statistical power of x sometimes. It will increase the statistical power of x sometimes. But the important thing to understand with that is that you have a model where you have x, and then you add x and m multiplied together. Those two are actually uh, estimating two different things. So you're estimating uh, the average effect of x when you have x only. When you have x and m multiplied, you're estimating the effect of x when m is at zero. So comparing statistical power between two coefficients that estimate two different things doesn't really make sense. But the yeah, statistical power tends to decrease, but it doesn't really make sense to talk about it. At the same time, the question might be asking about the statistical power for detecting moderation, uh, detecting uh, the interaction effects. Um, it is worth saying that power for interaction effects for a given sample size will be significantly lower than that for a main effect. Um, so if you are going to be looking for uh, interaction effects, it's best to get a much larger sample size to compensate for that. And there are some tools out there which will help you calculate what that is. Herman's website uh, does that for categorical moderators. There are other tools out there which can help with continuous moderators. 
questions they can do about that. Yeah. Uh, what, what do you think to cover the result for reverse rather than for the value of 25 and 55? Uh, I'm not sure how that be. So, has that been an answered? So, I just need to post the question uh, to rephrase it. Because uh, if you just talk about one regression, then, then you are estimating one line. And if you want to draw a moderator, then you are saying that you have a, a regression coefficient that varies. And uh, you want to know <coughs> how much it varies, so you have to calculate the different values. You can do it with the invalid method where you call, where you subtract 25 from the regression from the variable and then calculate the regression, then subtract 55 from the same variable and calculate the regression. But that's cumbersome instead of R. It's much better to calculate uh, it, it's uh, using marches for smooth data. The result will be exactly the same, just uh, less work for you when you do the marches instead of uh, using the simple technique there. They are uh, alternative way. The important thing to remember is that 25 and 55 in that example were just example values, and the model we estimated worked for any values. Um, what we definitely didn't do is split the sample into two. Um, to have a, a, a higher range and a lower range value, um, and those were the means of those, which is what one of the questions asked about. Um, that's not a good idea. Um, don't categorize continuous variable unless there's an exceptionally good reason to do so, and in most cases there isn't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so categorizing uh, continuous variables loses information from the data, uh, because, and, and losing information is generally not a good idea. Uh, what does it mean when x, y are raised in single on an extreme value of z? It means that uh, you have an effect that only the area occurs, it occurs in the subsample of, of, uh, of uh, i, z. And uh, it might be that there are some effects that affect only all of some people, but not others. So that is the meaning of the effect. That's a fine unit, it's not a problem. Uh, unequal sample sizes doesn't really make a difference. Uh, it affects statistical power. So if you have a, a group of uh, consisting of 90% of, uh, men, 10% women, if you want to estimate gender defect, you need a larger sample size than if you had a 50-50 split. So that is what it does. It doesn't really affect anything else. And uh, the standard errors and, and everything that we talk about so later will be calculated correctly regardless of uh, whether the data are balanced or not. Uh, how do you calculate uh, sample size? We, we discussed that there are power analysis tools, Herman Agri is written about that. Uh, uh, don't you have a test for category moderators? Do you want to take that one? So, yeah, so if the moderator is truly categorical, the Johnson naming test doesn't make sense because that's looking at values on a continuous variable that would be significant. Um, the example here suggests that um, we've got zero to five days, so that's a, a discrete um, numerical variable rather than a, a properly categorical one. Um, in that case, it would make sense perhaps to just to calculate the slope for each day uh, and see how that changes. Um, whether or not the test of whether it's significant is meaningful or not depends on the context and the sample size and so on. But you can do that for each day, and that's that's fine to do as long as you interpret uh, the results uh, sensitively. Yeah. How do we get the x becoming non-singular after adding m? So I assume this is a question of well, adding m without having an interaction of x and m in the model. It means that there are the, the, the original effect of x on y would be spuriously caused by m, as long as the model is otherwise correctly specified for the data, and uh, m times x is really significant. Or non significant, or M is a strong and significant effect. There is a, the effect, it's possible that you have a, a, a marginal effect, or for example, the effect of, of 55 years old might be statistically significant, whereas an effect for 25 year olds might not be statistically significant, but still the moderation effect is non significant because the moderation effect is a product of the coefficient and a particle value of the, of the moderator. So if you have a lot of variation in the moderator, then it is possible that you have a significant effect, a marginal effect, or simple slope, even if the moderator itself doesn't have a statistical significant effect. Generally, in this kind of situations where you think about how do I interpret this split result, calculating uh, 
marginal effects like, like the dyx in this data or simple slopes at the mean value at some useful values, theoretical mean values, and then comparing those against the original regression question we've done or whatever, will tell you quite a lot about how we put the data. All right, that's all the questions. Okay, any other questions at this point relating to what we talked about? Yes. So, um, I decided to move from uh, SPSS to R, so I had to relearn everything, basically. And I had to learn that how to calculate things for the first time instead of just plugging things in. And so, um, one thing that I saw when I went through, um, when I was thinking about centering, some people are talking about double mean center. Is that better somehow? There's, there's YouTube's about it. Um, or is still the standard single mean center? So, uh, if I understand correctly, double mean center means that you center the original variables, and then you calculate the interaction, and then you center the interaction. Uh, centering the interaction in all gravity, nothing else in the model. And uh, if, if, you don't inter if you don't interpret the intercept, then that's a completely useless step. Because you don't have something that you don't interpret. Generally, centering is something that uh, that is widely misunderstood. It's often discussed in the context of covinarity. And Dala and Sikar have written a great paper about the misunderstanding of covinarity uh, in the context of interactions and centering in over the research methods in 2012. And centering basically just tells you which, uh, which of the possible regression lines you, you print in the regression table. And if you don't look at the regression table, but you look at the, the plots, then it really doesn't make there are lots of recommendations where, where people just say whatever a previous person has said, and that leads to uh, all kinds of crazy practice that is not, not really based on, on, on anything. I, I got some, some videos about that on my YouTube channel. So if you ever wanted to know anything about the normality assumption, for example, how people teach it and how it really is, there's a 50 minute talk of one that I put up a few days ago. Yeah. Um, see that. Uh, a little bit behind where we set this point. So, um, if you've got any, any other questions at this point, please do put them into the uh, yeah, we'll website. Yeah, and then we'll, 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 we will come back to those. We want to make sure we get through um, the material we wanted to, because some of you will be here for that. Um, and, and so, please vote. If we run out of time, we'll, we'll go to the questions that are missing up. Yeah, we're not going to run out of time, though, unless with those and loads of questions. Because we're going to run through this a little bit more quickly then. All right. Um, so the next section is on three-way interactions. We probably don't need all this time on this, but just to give uh, a brief um, reminder or overview of three-way interactions, this is any time that you've got a relationship between X and Y, where we've got two different moderators, called Z and W, which not only both affect the relationship, but the interplay between the two moderators also is important. Um, this example from a paper by Marcus Baird shows that we've got um, four lines on a typical plot for, uh, to, uh, for a three-way interaction. So we've got lines plotted where one moderator is high and the other one is low, where they're both high, where they're both low, and so on. Um, what does this mean in practice? Well, testing three-way interactions uh, is really just an extended version of the two-way interactions that we've already seen. We're adding in another moderator, W here, which means we have to also add in another two two-way interaction terms, so XW and ZW, as well as the three-way interaction term, XZW, which is literally just the three variables multiplied by each other. We have to include all three of the two-way interaction terms, as well as all three of the main effects for this to be a meaningful model. So there are seven predictors plus an intercept uh, that we will get from this. Um, so we include all of uh, those low order effects, the three-way interaction terms, and then we see whether or not that three-way interaction term is significant. But a warning. Is your theory good? Is your measurement good? There are a lot of three-way interactions which are published. A lot of them seem to be really good. Some of them seem to be quite suspicious in, in terms of the effects they find. 
the power to detect a three-way interaction is considerably lower even than to detect a two-way interaction. And therefore, there is a greater chance that a result you find is significant might be a spurious effect, especially if the theory is not really solid. Because that means it's less likely that the, uh, the hypothesis is true, or more likely that the null hypothesis is true to begin with. Um, likewise, if the measurement isn't good, that will decrease the power as well. So unless you've got really good theory and really good measurements, I wouldn't recommend even testing the three-way interaction. But hopefully you will have, so we'll continue from this point onwards. So the syntax for doing this in the three different software packages we're talking about is given here. Again, in SPSS, you need to calculate the separate interaction effects before using the regression um, procedure in R and the stata. It does it automatically. Yeah, and then you have two hassles. It's is important when you have these high order interactions. It always acts the, uh, the, the local order curves. So this actually, uh, this train uh, times A times R, we actually add six variables to the model. It adds uh, all the variables themselves. Uh, all the two way interactions actually, that's more than six are calculated correctly. But uh, yeah, it adds a lot of variables to the model. So you can calculate yourself how many different ways you can combine. So, um, the example question, looking at training and job satisfaction, we had age as a moderator previously. If we had an autonomy as another moderator, we can get a, a result which looks like this. Um, so this is how we would plot it from uh, the Excel templates that uh, I, I've put out there. Um, again, in R and Stata, you would need to use this, but you can see that there are four lines here each of the line represents a different situation. And visually, we can see, you, I don't know how we can see from the back there, but you might be able to tell that there's one line which is steeper than the others, which is the, the, the white squares one, that's line number three for those age 25 and high in autonomy. Um, as a high in autonomy, this is plotted at this point, one standard deviation above the mean, as I said earlier, that's useful for plotting, it might not be the best thing to do for testing similar slopes. And there's nothing special in the Stata code, so you just give two different values of water of the, of the moderators, or values for two different moderators, so four values all together. But in R, using the, uh, the marginal effects package, this is a scenario where I would uh, use uh, the, the two-step approach by calculating gradient in one command holding in the second command. The reason is that the default plot option for this kind of model, for this package, produces you with a plot with, with uh, two, line, two panels with two lines each. So it doesn't put all the lines in one, one plot, but it produces two plots uh, or a plot with two panels. And if you want to compare all the four lines, it's more useful than a single plot. So this is an example where the, the two-step approach for, for plotting interactions would be better than just using the build. This data, when it launches plot, uh, that this is uh, done with two step, but using the plot option will do the same. It always puts all the all the about uh, effects into a single plot instead of, instead of two plots like artists. All right. So, um, unlike a two way interaction where you've only got two lines, and actually the fact that the interaction is significant in a two way interaction means that the lines are significantly different from each other. Those are absolutely equivalent. In three-way interactions, that's not necessarily the case, because we've got four lines here representing different combinations of the moderators. And we might have some hypotheses generated from theory that some lines would be different from others. In other words, particular combinations of the variables would be um, more important uh, for the relationship between X and Y than others. Um, so the hypothesis we might have here is that training predicts job satisfaction most strongly for younger workers with higher autonomy um, compared with situations for older workers or for old, uh, workers with lower autonomy. And to do this, we can use the slope difference test, um, and which explicitly looks at the differences between these lines. 
Um, and for this particular hypothesis, it would lead to equivalent sort of uh, tests that